welcome to our webinar. It's a pleasure to form part of this panel as moderator. I'd like to thank the International Cooperation Development Fund of Taiwan and the Taipei Economic and Cultural Office in New York for having organized this uh, excellent webinar. And as was seen at the beginning, the name is Engine for Sustainable Future, how sustainable financing can transform Latin American development post COVID-19 and beyond. Uh, joining me this morning for an hour and a half, we have uh, five uh, panelists. I will present in more detail uh, before each uh, presentation, but I would like to mention that uh, today we have Hernan Laneri Alvarado, uh, Chief Financial Officer of the Central American Bank for Economic Integration. We have Ms. Erin Murphy, Managing Director for the Indo-Pacific U.S. International Development Finance Corporation. With us also is Jonathan Liu, Director, Lending and Investment Department of the International Corporation and Development Fund of Taiwan. Also is uh, Mr. Mario Romero, General Director, of the Directorate of Internationalization and Information of the Vice Ministry of Small Medium uh, Enterprise in Paraguay, and Lisa Aragon, Deputy Director of Development Strategy Analysis, Secretary of Planning and Programming for the Presidency uh, in Guatemala. As I mentioned at the beginning, I believe that this webinar is utmost important, because as we know, sustainable financing to reach 17 SDGs by the year 2030 is crucial. And the pandemic of COVID-19 has only made the fiscal space even smaller for this type of crucial investment. And therefore, we'll be hearing from the panelists and afterwards in the discussion on how to face this dilemma that we have if we will reach the goals by 2030. I'd also like to mention that uh, we encourage the participants to use the chat box in the live stream of YouTube if they have any questions to ask uh, the panelists after the presentation. Once again, thank you very much for the participation in this webinar. We look forward to hearing from the participants. But first of all, I'd like to ask Mr. Timothy Siang, who's the Secretary General at the uh, International Corporation uh, and Development Fund of Taiwan to give us a brief presentation. Thank you, Mr. Swan. Thank you, uh, Minister Spalding, and best James Lee, dear panelists, friends and colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you are. On behalf of the Taiwan ICDF, it is a pleasure to welcome you to the 2021 United Nations High-Level Political Forum Side Event Webinar on Engine for a Sustainable Future, How Sustainable Financing Can Transform Latin American Development Post-COVID-19 and Beyond. First of all, I would like to thank the Taipei Economic and Cultural Office in New York for co-hosting this year's High-Level Political Forum Side Event with us again. It was in 2020 when we co-hosted the first virtual side event where we shared strategies from around the world on fighting COVID-19. We invited experts from different sectors, including public health, agricultural financing, education, and social protection to share their best practice in science, technology, and innovation for combating the pandemic and had a fruitful and inspiring discussion. While the development of vaccines have helped global efforts to restart economies, this webinar will focus on how sustainable financing can accelerate economic recovery and growth in the Latin America and the Caribbean region. The COVID-19 pandemic has dramatically set back progress on sustainable development exposing and exhibiting inequalities among people and countries. Vulnerable groups, including women and youth, have been particularly affected by job losses and the lack of access to financial support. Lockdowns and border closures have also changed our lifestyle 
and resulted in tremendous economic losses, especially for developing countries, including our allied and partner countries in Latin America. The pandemic threatens the region with even higher poverty levels, greater inequality, and increased debt. The region has only 8% of the global population, but accounts for more than 25% of COVID-19 deaths and lost an estimated 7% of GDP in 2020. As a Taiwan official aid agency, the Taiwan ICDF is dedicated to sharing our lessons learned with the international community. Drawing upon our development comparative advantages, we leverage our expertise in agricultural, public health, ICT, environment, as well as SMEs to assist our allied partner countries. We integrate innovative technology, skills, applications, and methodologies with available financial support to develop new projects and collaborate with new partners in line with SDGs and deepen project impacts and effects. To build a stronger partnership for responding to uncertainties in the post-COVID-19 era, the Taiwan ICDF, U.S. International Development Finance Corporation, and the CABE, the Central American Bank for Economic Integration, started our first tripartite cooperation by joining investment in CABE's regional emergency program for support and the preparation for COVID-19 and economic reactivation. We have committed to the two components of public sector operations and the micro, small, and medium-sized enterprises support facility to mitigate the impact of the crisis and build the resilience of the Latin American and the Caribbean region. I would also like to take this opportunity to congratulate and welcome CABE's first Asia office, newly opened in Taiwan on last Tuesday. I believe that it is symbolized the closer cooperation and the commitment of the partnership in the future. In addition to partnership with regional development banks and like-minded countries such as the U.S., the Taiwan ICDF continues bilateral cooperation with allied countries in developing innovative measures and instruments for increasing accessibility to sustainable finance. In Central America, we have implemented a climate change project using big data analysis to integrate governmental data on soil fertility, real-time rainfall climate, annual pests, and the disease change into a mobile app to enhance farmers' accessibility to technical knowledge. Farmers will be more resilient to climate change, thus providing higher possibility for microfinancing institutions to gain returns from lending and attracting potential investors to participate in sustainable financing. At the Paris Peace Forum on November 12, 2020, OECD Secretary General Angel Grill said over $379 trillion of total assets are in the system held by banks, institutional investors, and assist managers. Reallocating only 1.1% could be enough to fill the growing SDG financing gap. We need harmonized policies along the investment chain to make our savings and investment work better for people, planet, and to build systematic resilience. With the COVID-19 pandemic posing a significant threat to the world, we need more than ever to respond to these challenges with faster, smarter, and more organized solutions. As Albert Einstein once stated, in the midst of every crisis lies great opportunity. Through this webinar, we have the chance and opportunity to work together for a more sustainable world beyond COVID-19 with better methodology and a more efficient synergy. Taiwan is a part of the global community. We are here to listen and are willing to join the effort. With that, I wish this high-level political forum side event great success. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Secretary General Xiang, for your words, very profound and insight that you give towards the vision. And uh, that sets off very nicely 
our first uh, panelist. I'd like to present uh, Mr. Nan Naneri Alvarado, the Chief Financial Officer at Central American Bank for Economic Integration, ABE. He has over 25 years of experience in asset and liability management, debt capital markets, investment management, budgeting, and accounting. As CFO, he has successfully executed Sebae's financial strategy, leading the bank to optimal lending capacity, adequate levels of capital, and long-term financial sustainability. He has played a key role in improving Sebae's credit rating to AA category, becoming a frequent issuer in the international capital market, with permanent access to competitive funding, corporate governance strengthened, and the incorporation of new shareholders to the bank. As a member of the executive management team, Mr. Alvarado is responsible for the bank's finances, operations, financial policies, and relationship with lending institutions, investors, rating agencies, and external finance committee and credit committee. Mr. Alvarado holds a master's degree in business administration with a major in finance from the Catholic University of Honduras and a bachelor's degree in accounting from the National Autonomous University of Honduras. It is a pleasure for me to pass the floor to uh, Ms. Alvarado, who will give a 10-minute presentation on investing in, emerg uh, in emerging, oh, excuse me, the development, financing, and risk sharing in the area of, uh, era of COVID-19 and beyond. Ms. Alvarado, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Spalding. Thank you for, for the invitation to ICDF uh, to this uh, very important seminar. Uh, so, so we are uh, very involved in this uh, solution in the midst of the pandemic of the COVID-19. And now we are going to display the, a short presentation about uh, some um, specific activities that CAVE has carried on during the 2020 and now in 2021. If we, uh, Taiwan was the, the first uh, non-regional shareholder to join CAVE in 1992. And recently, because the capital increase that we implemented in 2020 uh, be became uh, the largest member with an 11. Uh, also, uh, the bank has developed a long-standing and fruitful relationship uh, with the Taiwanese institutions, such as ICDF Taiwan and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, with which we have implemented financing and technical assistance operation um, for almost about uh, 300 million. Slide nine shows how CAVE responded quickly to the country's financing needs through the design and implementation of a 3 billion emergency COVID-19 and economic reactivation program. This program made it possible to direct and mobilize our own resources and external resources in the form of emergency aid, donation of medical supplies, and financing to the public and private financial sectors. We, we define uh, eight components in order to address the main challenges in the public and the private sector. For example, we launch a credit line for uh, central banks, and also we provide one, uh, 100 million per country in order to uh, promote the acquisition of vaccines during the pandemic. This is a very important uh, figure because um, uh, this allowed the bank to assume a counter-cyclical role and reach historical levels in 60 years of history in loan approvals and disbursement of credit operation. Uh, for example, in credit uh, approvals, we reached 3.5 billion and disbursements 2.5 billion, which means uh, upsides on a, on a growth rate of 31% compared with 2019 versus 2020. Uh, the crisis also gave us the opportunity to design innovative uh, financial scheme uh, that promote the participation of external sources and therefore uh, resharing mechanism. This becomes fundamental to provide comprehensive high impact support to the countries. Next slide, we, we will see uh, an example of this in slide 12. Uh, among this mechanism, me mechanism, I can mention a credit facility for the recovery of the small and medium enterprises, recognizing that they are the engine for economic growth, development, and job creation. The facility was combined with a guarantee fund to cover up 75% of the credit risk of loans granted by financial intermediaries, including the participation of the ICDF Taiwan, the USDFC, the European Union, 
and the KFW of Germany as a co-financiers. We also reactivated financial schemes that are, we, we think we are very appropriate for the current circumstances, such as financing through export trade agencies who leverage a greater amount of funds involving exporters, know-how and technology from other countries outside the region. In this example, we can mention a partnership with the UK, UK Export Credit Agency in order to promote a COVID-19 hospital in Nicaragua. Finally, uh, we use uh, financial blending schemes uh, with credit facilities provided, for example, with the Green Climate Fund and the Kexin Bank EDCF uh, of the Republic of Korea, focus on supporting high impact sectors and economic recovery uh, and such as climate change and with highly and very favorable, favorable concessional financial incentive to favor beneficiary countries in the Central American region. So thank you very much, Mr. Spalding. Thank you. Thank you, Hernan, for that excellent summary of all the great work Bay is doing. And also congratulations, all of you, for opening the office in Taipei. It's a great way to keep growing in everything you're doing. And I look forward to asking some questions after the rest of the panelists have done their presentation. I'd like now to present uh, Ms. Erin Murphy. He is the Director of Indo-Pacific at the U.S. International Development Finance Corporation. She's responsible for business development, engagement with U.S. government agencies, and collaboration with regional governments, partners, and development finance institutions. Prior to joining the DFC, she was a founder and principal of INLE, Advisory Group, Maramar, an emerging markets-centric strategic advisory firm, promoting responsible and transparent investment in supporting businesses and organizations, from Fortune 500 companies to nonprofits, enter and successfully navigate challenging markets. Ms. Murphy also served in multiple capacities in the U.S. government, including as a special assistant to the Office of the Special Representative and policy coordinated for Miramar, and as an intelligence analyst, garnering awards for excellence in analysis and interagency collaboration. Ms. Murphy was a 2017-2018 Council on Foreign Relations Hitachi International Affairs Fellow of Japan. She currently serves on the Advisory Council for the Southeast Asia Forum for the Stimson Center, and is also a graduate of Tufts University and holds an MA from John Hobson School for Advanced International Studies with a focus on Japan studies. So today, um, Ms. Murphy will be presenting the topic, Investing in Emerging Markets, Facilitating Resources to Tackle Complex Development Challenges, Including the Impact of COVID-19. Ms. Murphy, the floor is yours. Thank you, Ambassador Spalding. And I want to thank um, the, our host for bringing me um, to present at this uh, very important seminar and very timely seminar and also to thank my fellow panelists for both sharing their knowledge and joining me today. Um, so good morning, good afternoon and good evening everyone. Thank you for joining. Um, as Ambassador Spalding said, my name is Erin Murphy and I typically cover the Indo-Pacific, but I also cover our international partnerships and these international partnerships also have us work in other regions. So I'm very happy to be covering a different region today for me in Latin America. The U.S. International Development Finance Corporation, you may have known us um, as in our previous iteration of the Overseas Private Investment Corporation, or OPEC. Uh, DFC started in January of 2020, and we are the U.S. government's development finance institution, where we look to find private sector solutions to difficult and challenging development issues. So we have an array of tools that we can use to address the challenges and every single one of these can be applied to um, developmental issues in Latin America and of course globally. Um, we offer debt financing. This is one of our um, most favorite and well-used tools where we provide loan um, and debt financing for major projects. We also have a new tool called Equity Investments, where we typically provide um, anywhere from five to $25 million in equity investments, but this is quite a new tool. Uh, we also provide feasibility studies through our technical assistance, where we look to see uh, whether or not a project um, can fit with our, within the DFC's um, mandate and how we can help bring it to our screening process. We also have investment funds 
political risk insurance, which is another one of our, our traditional tools. And again, as I mentioned, technical assistance. For our debt financing tools and for our political risk insurance, we can cover anywhere from 1 million to 1 billion, and that's billion with a B, US dollars. Next slide, please. So our investment priorities have um, remained roughly the same from the previous administration to the current administration, but obviously with the new challenges that we face, uh, we have shaped and focused more on climate and of course global health. For climate, uh, the DFC has recently made an announcement that we're looking to make our portfolio net zero by 2040, which means that we'll be looking for investments that help mitigate and adapt to the challenges of climate, but also to promote renewable energy solutions and other technical advances, whether it be electric vehicles, battery storage, or even bringing up uh, grids to become more efficient and reach the, the key standards that we're looking for in, in these types of investments. For global health, obviously COVID-19 has dominated the conversation about global health, but I think there's two words that we're looking for both in this investment priority, but also for our entire portfolio. And the two key words I think are recovery and resilience. Obviously we all need to recover from the impact of COVID. Um, in the previous presentation, we saw what the impact of COVID has been for Latin America. These challenges are global and we need to build these systems to be resilient for either the next pandemic or the next challenge that comes our way, whether it's climate, pandemic or another challenge. Um, we're also looking to invest in gender equity. We have a strong gender lens of, of investment and look to um, the management, to uh, programs and, and hiring women, but also strengthening their capacity to work within certain sectors and systems. We're also looking to invest in ICT. Uh, internet connectivity and technology, and then finally to really encourage inclusive growth. These cover uh, a multitude of sectors, so we're not limited to one, and we don't budget for regions or sectors. It's what um, investments make the most sense for us that fits within our mandate and really targets the development challenges that we find. Next slide, please. So for the Latin America and Caribbean, um, this is one of the critical and top priorities for the DFC. It comprises 30% of our portfolio in the region. And this includes, um, we have a $9.2 billion portfolio and we're committed to supporting private sector investment throughout Latin America and the Caribbean from Mexico and the Northern Triangle countries of El Salvador, Honduras and Guatemala to Colombia, Brazil and emerging economies across the region. The DFC is mandated to work in lower income countries and lower middle income countries. And so that's where our focus is going to be. Um, Latin America and the Caribbean are critical partners in promoting prosperity, stability, development, and security throughout the Western hemisphere. And so we're looking to support these economies from their small and medium sized enterprises to their other businesses that target climate, inclusive growth, gender, health, and ICT. So the previous tools that I mentioned before in our products, they're meant to help businesses across the region pursue promising opportunities and improve lives, but they're also committed to addressing the region's most critical development challenges. Um, this includes injecting much needed liquidity into the market to create opportunity, expanding access to financial services for underserved populations, which include SMEs, women and entrepreneurs and rural population infrastructure, bolstering clean power development, and supporting resiliency to healthcare systems by advancing health-related investments. So here I'd like to offer some examples of what um, some of our investments are doing. Um, these are past investments. Um, I, I won't go into what our current pipeline is, but just to let you know what type of sectors. Um, our pipeline is always shifting and moving and, and um, some things have been committed, but we haven't dispersed yet. But in April of this year, we committed a 22 million direct loan to Forest First Columbia to support the expansion of sustainable forestry um, on degraded land in Eastern Columbia. This targets a few things. One, um, our pillar on climate. This helps support um, the adaptation mitigation of the effects of climate change. And it also helps us develop an area that is, has been typically poor and underdeveloped. So we're also looking in our climate pillar to support solar investments in low and lower middle income countries. And one way that we're doing that is issuing loans to support off-grid solar lending across the globe. 
Um, we're doing this in lower income countries in Africa, Indo in, in the Indo-Pacific, but also in Latin America and the Caribbean. So we're looking for these opportunities throughout the region to provide renewable energy solutions to um, energy issues. Um, we're also both bolstering marine conservation in St. Lucia. In March 2020, so in last year, right at the beginning of the pandemic, we issued $100 million in political risk insurance to support blue bonds. And these blue bonds help bolster coastal economies in St. Lucia. Um, typically, these smaller island economies don't have as many investment opportunities, and we're looking really to help support them. This is one way that we're doing, and is to help establish a long-term source of funding for critical marine conservation and activities uh, to work with the Nature um, Conservancy. This helps pr promote tourism aspects as well as um, as we're helping bolster the marine conservation. And that's typically an attractive issue for ecotourists and another area that we can help develop St. Lucia's economy, especially in tourism. Uh, for these small island economies, there's really not many sectors that we can promote. So if we can promote an eco-friendly tourism, um, this really helps. Um, we're also expanding private sector lending and operations in the Amazon. As I mentioned, um, the DFC is really focused on supporting small, medium-sized enterprises, but also MSMEs as well. We're going to the to the smallest uh, business that we can go because these are going to be critical in the post-COVID recovery. We provide a $100 million loan portfolio guarantee that um, also addresses climate, um, but also gender inclusion and the conservation of natural resources and increasing the socioeconomic well-being of rural families, um, often um, helping women in these regions as well. And we expand sustainable business opportunities, giving them um, a long-term horizon for their investments and for their small businesses and enforce based value chains and other related businesses. This is particularly unique to the Amazon and we're looking both to conserve this natural resource, but also help farmers and rural communities in these regions to do this. Um, we're also looking, and I don't have a slide for this, but we're also looking to um, help with the healthcare industry, whether that's increasing the expansion of vaccine production or to make healthcare uh, systems ready for pandemic preparedness. We've already um, provided these lending opportunities in Senegal, South Africa, in India to expand vaccine production, and we're looking to boost Latin America's capabilities as well. This means working with the private sector, but also the government to see what is available and how we can work in these industries, whether it's to boost supply chains or contribute to supply chains, whether that's um, tubing, packaging, glass vial manufacturing, or whether it's producing the vaccines themselves. Uh, this is my contact information, and I'd be happy to talk more about what we're doing in the Q&A session, um, and I'm sure that we'll be providing our contact information at the end of this presentation. So thank you for listening, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Erin, for your presentation and those concrete examples of uh, how EFC is now targeting its portfolio and everything that's being done in our in our region. So thank you very much. And we'll get into more detail, I think, in the question and answer session. But I would like to now turn the floor to Mr. Jonathan Liu. He's a director of lending and investment department of Taiwan ICDF. This position is in charge of management of the funds with more than $520 million, which is made to 14 investment and 50 financing projects in the developing countries. Previously, he served as Deputy Director of the Technical Cooperation Department to oversee the operation of 22 technical missions and 58 technical assistance projects in 26 partner countries. He had also been involved in drafting white papers on foreign aid policy and the supervision of developmental projects for various countries. He was working also hired as associate to the program department of the East and private sector group of the Asian Development Bank in 2001. He had worked for the Taiwan ICDF for more than 24 years and experienced diversified development issues such as inclusive financing, climate resilience, private sector development and vocational trading, training. So Mr. Liu will give a 10 minute presentation on the accelerating transformation with integrative and innovative measures of technical and financial support. For is yours, Mr. Liu. Thank you, moderator, for your kind introductions. Uh, I'm Jonathan Liu from Taiwan ICDF 
it's my honor to be here to share some experience with the friends of Taiwan, how we integrate and uh, innovate the transformation through technical and uh, financial support. And uh, my presentation will bring you a case how we support the micro, small and the medium sized enterprise in Paraguay. Before we get into the main topic, allow me to take a few minutes to give you overall situation of the micro, small and the medium enterprise sectors in Paraguay. As you see the slide, as a matter of fact, MSME are vital economic pillars in Paraguay. The number of enterprises in Paraguay are more than 250,000, which is accounting for about 97% uh, of total enterprises, 65% of total workforce. This supposed uh, place these uh, sectors at a critical position to have a certain impact on Paraguay's economies. But unfortunately, uh, the whole sector faces a huge financing gap at roughly 4 billion US dollars. And the last, that's cause total save, um, sales revenues only contribute for 14% of Paraguay GDP. Uh, even the MSME employ are the most work workers and uh, account for the highest percentage of industry in Paraguay. But actually, so the lack of the managerial and the operational capabilities will base a big barrier to transform these sectors. And the local constitutions are resources for enterprises is scarce and diffuse within the countries. The last challenge they face has shown its weakness to access financing resources and worsen their capacity to scale up the business operation. So the Taiwan ICDF uh, quickly screened the economy, the whole economic structures as a whole, and uh, co-work with the Ministry of Industry and the Commerce of the Black Rye to identify the priority industry to be assist to be assisted, uh, not only in capacity building but uh, also policy review on MSME sectors. Now, based on the due diligence work and the industry analysis on, the, on these sectors we made. In 2019, Taiwan ICDF launched a technical assistance of the project, which aims to strengthen, um, strengthen MSME capacity in Paraguay by linking with the local industry uh, associations to benefit them even more enterprises. And uh, actually, the project is uh, consists of uh, three dimensions with, with government, with government level, industrial level, as well as enterprise levels. In government level, we assist the ministries in setting up an information collecting system to analyze, uh, to identify focal industry as apparel, modality leaders, and diary products. So as to the industrial levels, we mobilize the public and the private resources to host a series of training courses regarding to management and technical aspects. So in terms of the enterprise levels, the Taiwan expert in Paraguay provide targeted enterprises with diversified consulting service, such as uh, streamlining uh, productions uh, marketing productions, uh, accounting knowledge, as well as uh, some stop up uh, spheres. Following by the accom accomplishment of the technical assistance being made in, in the past, uh, last year, 2020s, we further partnered with a uh, foundation, foundation, like why it's, uh, it's kind of recognized as a public benefit institution. Uh, we offer uh, uh, these foundations with a soft loan in amount of three million US dollars for expanding uh, financial inclusive uh, uh, programs that help enterprise local enterprises increase access to affordable financial products that meet their urgent needs on the on times in the COVID nineteen era. Moreover, so we based on the government policies encouraging the local enterprises to have uh, recognized entities. The loan applications are required borrowers to have a tax registration first. And, and we, we see that through providing advisory service, incubation support, 
and uh, enter entrepreneurial education. And uh, all of these supports combined with the funding resources we offer. I'm sure that our diversified support will make it possible for local enterprises to attain sustainable development. Uh, here, I would like to present you a case how we adjust project strategy to respond to COVID-19 crisis. Last March, this year March, uh, the COVID-19 was uh, confirmed to have reached progress and uh, has led to tremendous loss on local economy economies. Uh, in the beginning of the pandemic, wearing a mask is one of the most effective way to protect people away from a virus. So to address these issues of urgent demands on masks within the park, right? Uh, Taiwan Taking Missions quickly can coordinate coordinate with the uh, textile uh, association to design the standards and the specifications of mask for further mask production. A crisis is, uh, uh, I would say that a crisis is a chance. Uh, uh, Taiwan Technical Missions and the Paraguay Pla team have successfully facilitated the textile, textile industry to transform and uh, put, to produce over 3 million masks for healthcare, by roughly generating revenues over 1 million US dollars in short time. It undoubtedly created a positive social impact at this difficult time. Slides, I will give you a case how we help the local tea industry transformation to have an environmental uh, impact. The Madai tea is a tea-like beverage popular in Paraguay. However, the tea uh, economy has been limited to domestic market with no significant external investment and no strict protocol of pesticide residue inspections. The light impeded this industry to access to overseas market. To address these issues, Taiwan Technician firstly went through the producing chains and uh, introduced tea farmers with environmental farming, such as uh, reasonable fertilizers, pesticide safety to pass the tax city test and uh, meet the European Union's importation requirement. And uh, following by the assisting, uh, uh, assisting the local manufacturer to design an attractive tea bag packaging for promoting Madai tea to international consumers. And this is the case what we are looking for the balance between the environment concerns and the economic goals. Corresponding to the SDGs, recently the COVID-19 pandemic has created economic uncertainties and this has caused lots of challenges these small size enterprises are experiencing. And the overall support we offer is not only help lead sectors and uh, women-led enterprises in Paraguay increasing their resilience against the crisis during the pandemic, but also attaches the importance to overcome the financial inequities in the future. So the efforts we made for the MSME sectors in Paraguay undoubtedly equal to SDG target uh, 8.3. Uh, to encourage the formulation and the growth of micro, small, and medium-sized enterprises, including through access to financial services, and also equal to uh, target 9.3 to increase the access of small-scale industrial and other entrepreneurs, in particular in developing countries, to financial services. Uh, in conclusion, I would say that access to financial services is also essential to the ability uh, of business, business to invest, employ people, and grow. And is also a level and essential element of an inclusive growth. Thank you for your listening. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Liu, for your, your presentation and the focus on, on, on my country, on Paraguay, and all the work that is being done on uh, micro, small, and medium enterprises, as well as how, how Aaron mentioned the support of OPEC and now DFC in our countries in this sector. It, it's crucial for, for recovery of the economy and inclusive growth. I think your presentations set up 
uh, very well the next presentation. It's my pleasure to present uh, Mr. Mario Romero. And Mario is Director General of Internationalization and Information of the Vice Ministry of Micro, Small and Medium Enterprises at the Ministry of Industry and Trade. Previously, Mr. Romero was National Director of ReadyX, which is the uh, network of investment and export network of, of the Ministry of Industry and Trade. He's, he was also Coordinator of Planning and Institutional Relations of the Ministry of Finance for the National Scholarship Program for Foreign Countries, which is known in Paraguay as DECAL. He's a co Coordinator for Commercial Jobs, Social and Economic Research conducted in Paraguay, Argentina, the United States and Spain. He's worked in the Guilds Board of Directors as a member. Uh, he's, a, he's a professor at the university and also writes as a communist, a commun communist, uh, a communist in, uh, in the newspapers in Paraguay. So he's a Bachelor of Economics. He's a business engineer. Uh, he has a Master's in Strategic Management in Information Technology from the University of León, Spain, and a PhD in Administration. So it's my pleasure to give the floor to Mario, who will be presenting in the next uh, 10 minutes, Strategic Sustainable Finance, Working with the Small and Medium Enterprises. Mario, buen día, thank you. Hi, hello, good morning to everyone, and good night to some, some people. Thank you very much, Mr. Uh, James Paldin, who, who is a former Minister of Finance of my country too. Thank you for your support. Now I will present the case, uh, in a special case uh, that uh, we titled uh, Strategic Sustainable Finance Working with and for SMEs. It's important to mention here that the concept of uh, SMEs includes the uh, micro, small, and medium uh, Paraguayan enterprises. Yeah, the project context in order to help SMEs in Paraguay improve their operational performance. Uh, Taiwan ICDF uh, launched the project for strengthening the, the capacity of the orientation system for SMEs called Comitimes Project uh, in January 2019. The, the key component of the Comitimes Project consists of providing guidance service to SMEs in the four main sectors of Paraguay. You have in your screen. The textile, yerba mate, is the second one. The third, the third is a leather and the dairy, industry sectors. The Fumipines project had achieved some positive results in order to offer more financial support necessary to meet the financial demands of SMEs. Taiwan ICDF works in cooperation with the Paraguayan Foundation for Cooperation and Development Fundación Paraguaya, a grants and grants a loan of 3 million US dollars to refinance SMEs. Here's how it works, a strategic alliance, a partnership uh, uh, among the Ministry of Trade and Industry, uh, Paraguay, uh, Paraguayan Foundation for Cooperation and Development, Fundación Paraguaya, and the third one is the ICDF Taiwan. Uh, there is a, the main actor, they are the main actor that make the project possible. The country where the project is implemented is Paraguay. Uh, the borrower uh, is Fundación Paraguaya, Paraguayan Foundation for Cooperation and Development, and the executive agency is Fundación Paraguaya too. Uh, the project period is uh, three years, uh, uh, long repayment terms in 15 years, uh, including three year grace period. And the loan amount is 3 million US dollars. Yeah. The main goal uh, of the project uh, is uh, expand uh, financial inclusion to SMEs in Paraguay to facilitate their access to financial channel as a means of increasing competitiveness. Uh, here I, I want to add uh, uh, the this financial product includes non-financial benefits. Uh, let me give you some example. Uh, training sessions, basic medical insurance, discount in supermarket chains and cinemas, and insurance on remaining debts in case of death. It's like um, uh, life insurance more. 
Project Destruction, eh, Fundación Paraguaya will use the loan granted by Taiwan ICBF to grant loans to SMEs in three categories, three main categories. All eligible final debt store are required to appear in the single taxpayer register, RUC in Spanish. Here we have the three categories. Uh, category one is include uh, SMEs that are member of the industrial association belonging to the four sector that I mentioned before, supported by the FOMIPIMES project or SMEs assisted uh, and promoted by the Ministry of Trade and Industry of Paraguay, my ministry. Uh, here I want to add just uh, that the category one, the above mentioned industries association include Asociación de Confeccionistas del Paraguay, the Paraguayan Manufacturer Association for the textile industry and Centro Yerbatero Paraguayo for the Yerba Mate Industry Association. The Taiwan ICDF will notify Fundación Paraguaya of other industry associations accepted under the project during the coming years in the, of the implementation of the FOMIPIMES project, including Association for the Leather and Dairy Industry. Uh, here, uh, category two uh, 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 includes business run by women, including women owned and managed uh, SMEs, SMEs with more than 50% of female employment or comparative with a majority of female members. The category three uh, includes other SMEs not included in the category specified, uh, specified above. Okay. Here we have the distribution of the loan granted by the Taiwan ICDF. Uh, the category one uh, uh, with 1.25 million US dollars and category two, 0.5 million US dollars and the category three, 1.25 uh, US million dollars. Implementing provision, the project is uh, ex executed by the Fundación Paraguayo with grants working. Uh, capital loans and fixed assets are credit for SMEs according to the location of funds indicated before and with the refinancing condition adapted to the financial demands and economic cycle of objective SMEs. Fundación Paraguaya evaluates all loans and uh, application in accordance with the credit policy and approval procedure. Requirements for applicants are uh, is uh, just two uh, very very simple uh, all applicants must provide their unique taxpayer register group to fundacion paraguaya the second one is all category application must be proposed by the mic minister of trade and industry or the fomi pymes project or uh, by the unions of the four sector mentioned before uh, the textile geromate letter and dairy and we'll go to the Fundación Paraguaya for the study and evaluation of the loan. Here I want to add that this project focuses, this is very important because this project focuses on SMEs that don't have condition to access credit in the formal system, uh, financial system, mainly because the, these SMEs don't have the minimum uh, required by the formal financial system. Project benefits are three. Uh, the first one is uh, it supports by the policy of the Paraguayan government in promoting the formalization of SMEs. The SMEs benefit from improved access to the financial capital necessary to increase the competitiveness. And the third one is um, about the, uh, this project contributes to sustainable de development goals, the SDG. In this case, SDG A and SDG 9. Just to mention the, uh, the SDG A, talk about the decent work and economic growth, and the SDG night talk about the infrastructure and industrialization. Okay, before I finish, yeah, I, I was to mention that uh, 230 credits have been placed until today since December 2020. It's about 553,000 US dollars, uh, more or less. And the credit delinquency increased during the pandemic mainly due to the decrease in sales, incomes, and sick staff. Thank you very much for your attention.
Thank you very much, Mario, for your presentation, which joined very well with what Mr. Liu was mentioning as part of ICDF and the great work you're doing in such important sectors for the uh, micro and small uh, medium businesses in, in Paraguay. I wanted to finish up the round of panelists. Last but not least uh, is to present uh, Lisa Maria Aragón, who is the Deputy Director of Development Strategy Analysis of the Secretary of Planning and Programming for the Presidency of Guatemala. She was uh, previously Operation Supervisor for Gonduet, uh, Guatemala from 2016 to 2020. Uh, is also Assistant Professor at the University of San Carlos in Guatemala between 2016 and 2018. Uh, she was Assistant Supervisor from 2011 and 2016, also in uh, Gonduet, Guatemala. Uh, currently, Lisa is doing uh, a master's in finance, and she has a business degree in economics from the University of San Carlos in Guatemala. So it is my privilege to turn the floor over to, to Lisa, who will be giving us a 10-minute presentation on navigating sustainable development practitioners in uncertain economic environment brought on by COVID-19. So Lisa, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much for the warm introduction, Mr. Spalding. Um, I also want to thank our host and all the other panelists for all their knowledge. The topic I'll be covering today is navigating sustainable development practitioners in the uncertain economic environment brought on by COVID-19. I would like to start, um, I'm sure you all already know here, but I would like to start just by reviewing the concept of sustainable development. Um, this is the development or growth that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of the future generations. As well as I would like to review the concept of development practitioner, which is a person or a manager, both in the public and private sectors that influence growth that meets the needs of the present without compromising the future, meaning that they guide their organizations in the direction of an integrated approach of sustainability. Um, in other words, they are the people who apply the theories and ideas related to sustainable, sustainable development to achieve goals within the organization. Um, the next topic I would like to talk about is the economic environment, both globally and in Guatemala. Um, the world is facing an economic crisis and powered by the pandemic of COVID-19. Uh, this has caused a lot of factors uh, that affect our daily life, including uncertainty in the markets, disturbance in the supply chains, raising unemployment, closure of businesses, and not to mention, most importantly, the pandemic has brought a lot of loss in human health and life that has affected us directly. As you can see on the table, showing the projections uh, of global growth domestic product for 2020, um, there was a negative growth projection and a slight recovery in 2021. However, we need to take in factor that such a reduction of economic activity caused in great part of measures that were taken by local governments to try to mitigate the spread of the virus. Um, the government, most of the world governments have still taken many measures to try to alleviate the effects of the pandemic on the global economy. Uh, this has included from governments to increase their uh, government spending and help the economic reactivation. However, especially in developing countries such as Guatemala, uh, they are already weak health system has had a tremendous effect on the conditions of life of the people, even with the, med with the policies that have been in place by the government to try to mitigate the effects of the pandemic. Talking a little bit more about Guatemala, we can see that similar problems as the economic uh, environment globally manifest in Guatemala such as uh, decelerization of economic activity, drop in our gross domestic product, slow economic recovery, rising unemployment rates, uncertainty in the markets, and lower investments in our country. As you can see in this graph, this is the gross domestic growth rate in Guatemala from the fourth trimester of 2019 to the first trimester of 2021. As you can see, um, there was a deep decrease in the growth rate for Guatemala during the second trimester of 2020 when the country started shutting down due to the uh, policies 
put on by the government to try to mitigate the spread of the virus. This was a sharp decline in our economic activity. Our index of monthly economic activity had a contraction of 8.6% just in the month of June of 2020 compared to the month of June of 2019. According to the Banco of Guatemala, they estimate that the GDP contraction in 2020 was, um, will not be recovered by uh, 2021. Similar to the global economy, the local one is highly impacted in the uncertainty of the virus has brought in all aspects, including uh, the uncertainty of when the vaccination program will reach all of the population and we can have a steady recovery of our economics. Now, moving on to specific um, SDGs, I would like to highlight five uh, for the global impact that it had um, due to COVID-19. For example, the SDG number one, which is no poverty, there has been a reduction or loss of income, especially in vulnerable populations in the world. For the SDG number two, zero hunger, the production and distribution of food might have been affected or interrupted due to the closures of many countries. SDG number five, gender equality, there is high, higher levels of domestic violence reported during the lockdowns. SDG number eight, decent work and then economic growth. The deceleration of economic activity reduced income and there was a risen unemployment rates. And SDG 10, reduced inequality. Vulnerable populations were at higher risk of being affected by the social and health aspects of COVID-19. In Guatemala, the impact of the SDG were similar, for example, to give some uh, specific indicators for the SDG number one, no poverty, there was a 2.63 increase in extreme poverty in the year 2020, as well as a 1.96 increase in the uh, general poverty. Uh, there was also for SDG number two, zero hunger, an increase in acute malnourishment in short term and chronic mal uh, malnourishment in the long term. When we talk about gender equality, in Central America, 60% of women in the workforce work in the economic sector most affected by the pandemic meaning services such as hotels and restaurants sdg number eight decent work and economic growth there was a decrease of our gross domestic product and our gross domestic product per capita and there was a loss over 200,000 jobs and the sdg number 10 in reducing equality as well we were very hit with our very vulnerable populations a high percentage of our population lives in poverty which were more affected by the social and health aspects of covid 19. really that was all a layout for what is it that we have to do now how do we navigate through all the challenges so first of all, we do need a participation of all sectors in order to be able to combat the challenges brought by COVID-19. And what do we mean by all sectors? We mean the public sector, the private sector, and of course, uh, civil society or the society in each country. The public sector, we include all government institutions in which they need to execute within their power the policies that are um, that were made in order to achieve the SDG goals. In the private sector, which are organizations and firms that have economic activity, they need to execute programs and projects that have social business responsibility, meaning that they have a direct link to the goals while at the same time protecting the rights of the workers and all uh, environmental and sanitary requirements. And the civil society, meaning us as a society, this include groups, and uh, groups of people or individuals that need to uh, that need to be empowered to keep a close check on the government and to be able to be advocates for themselves in order for the development to occur within the organizations in which they work or they participate in. So. To, in the roadmap or rebuilding post COVID-19, uh, well, what we need to make sure that we address are that financing for this gap of reaching the goals was already a challenge before the pandemic. Therefore, these three sectors that I previously mentioned are key to breach the gap and be able to reach the goals. And how are we going to do that? I believe that the most important um, factor is going to be planning towards 
that long-term development, sustainable development, and reevaluating the actions taken before the pandemic. For example, in Guatemala, we have uh, we we guide ourselves from the SDGs, and from there we made a national development plan called Catum Nuestra Guatemala 2032. From there, we um, develop 10 strategic goals in order to meet the SDGs that were associated with 24 um, development results. And that goes a, a layer more in that each government that is elected needs to present them, needs to present uh, a plan for their government. So for example, in the current government, there are goals, 50 to be exact, that should be met by 2023. These goals, 31 of these 50 goals have already been costed to be a, uh, of a value of 109 billion quetzales in order to be reached by 2023. Therefore, it needs to be work that for example, the loans that we have been given in order to help cope with the COVID-19 pandemic is used according to the plans that we have that all link each other to sustainable development goals in the long term. For example, $500 million that were given by the World Bank um, to help mitigate the COVID-19 crisis went for it to sectors such as small and medium enterprises to help reactivate the economy and help the country move forward with the pandemic after the pandemic as you know the growth in economic activity or in the gdp doesn't necessarily mean that there is development but only growth so it's only if we're able to link the goals with the programs um, that the government implements so that we can see real change in the living conditions of the population that we're going to be able to reach the goals of the SDGs by 2030. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Lisa. I think what you described in the case of Guatemala is similar to a roadmap that all of our countries have to uh, get out of COVID-19. And I think with what you have presented, it also uh, opens up the floor for the questions that uh, we have uh, prepared and also some questions that we received through YouTube. So I'd like, uh, if you allow me to go directly, uh, trying to respect the, the time we have, but I want to go directly to the first question and ask uh, Hernan um, if he could briefly mention, um, based on what Lisa had talked about, in the case of Guatemala, the V-shaped recovery, but the, the concern on future growth. The question or none would be uh, that many countries in Central America are still, are still suffering from COVID-19 pandemic. 19 pandemic. Due to an increase in vaccination rates, still need to be cautioned, cautious of a possible next wave. How does Cave respond to these concerns? What are the key elements for success in your opinion? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Spalding, for the question. And uh, yes, uh, we're still experimenting a very complicated situation here in Central American countries. Uh, for Just for example, uh, the, the population that have received one doses of the vaccine in some countries is less than 1%. That, that shows the, 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 the challenge that our countries are facing in terms to tackle the the COVID-19 situation. Uh, for example, yesterday, uh, Guatemala and El Salvador announced new measures in order to ban some uh, social public uh, events or to require the, uh, the, the use of obligated of the mask, uh, for example. So, so we are, we are experimenting a new waves and also the, the, appear, uh, the, the new, new variants of the virus pose a challenge for, for the region. I would say that the key elements to, to, to success in these special circumstances uh, includes a, a fast and a quick response to the countries and also uh, to provide a flexible financial solu solution depending on the stage of the pandemic. For example, at the very beginning, CAVE provide, provided uh, funds to emergency purposes. Later on, uh, we created a facility to 
support the countries to the acquisition of the vaccines. And now, uh, for example, in Nicaragua, we are providing financing with the UKF uh, to, to build a hospital for COVID-19 patients. So depending on the stage of the, the pandemic, we need to be uh, very flexible flexible, uh, and try to adapt quickly. And uh, I, would, I would like to mention a very ambitious project that uh, CAVE is uh, recently launched, which uh, means the imp design and implementation of a biocluster park in the Central American region in order to have the capacity and the abilities to produce and manufacture our own vaccines in terms of the facing of new crises in the future. Thank you very much. It's a great work that you're doing for the region and good luck with all the policies. As, as we mentioned, Central America is not an uh, island of what is not happening in the world and there's great concern of the uh, of possible Delta variant uh, arriving to, to our region uh, and affecting growth once again. I would like to also take the opportunity to ask uh, Aaron a question about uh, I have a sp soft spot for OPIC because uh, 15 years ago, when I was ambassador of Paraguay in the US, the chance to uh, meet with the CEO of OPIC at the time, with Sir um, Moshbacher Jr., and, and get OPIC to deepen its relationship with Paraguay. And it's great to see that DFC has continued. Uh, just a, recently, two weeks ago, Secretary of uh, State Department has announced a new loan for the sector in, in Paraguay. But I'd like, Aaron, if you could uh, briefly mention the main differences from OPIC to DFC. And I, I found very interested what you men mentioned about the net zero portfolio by 2040 and other aspects. But how, did, how has uh, DFC evolved from OPIC and, and the new opportunities that we can find uh, with you? Thank you for that question, and um, and I appreciate your soft spot for OPIC. And uh, the I, I would say that the the DFC um, maintains some of the the core products and focus from OPIC, but um, with the advent of the Build Act, which was a bipartisan piece of legislation, a, a rare act in Washington D.C. that created the DFC, expanded our mandate, and I think gives us greater tools to work in Paraguay, but also throughout Latin America. So I think that the transition is exciting. Um, it makes us a lot more proactive and aggressive in finding new opportunities to help development challenges. So um, I'll just go through the, the main differences and, and really what um, is going to make our work so much more exciting. And I think so much more um, tangible, especially after COVID um, and it, well, hopefully soon, um, but also in the, in the lead up to when we finally get past this. But um, previously, OPIC really focused on commercially viable uh, transactions, and DFC is still looking to do that. Um, we look for bankable projects, but bankable projects that are highly developmental. And some of the key areas that I pointed out in my previous present or in my presentation were on gender, ICT, healthcare, climate. Um, and so we're really trying to bring that uh, to our investment. Um, one of the other key aspects is that we no longer require a U.S. nexus in our investment. So when we go into countries, we can invest with the local private sector. And this really opens up a lot of opportunities for, for us. We took USAID's Development Credit Authority, which allows us to better assess and analyze uh, local businesses that we could potentially partner with. Um, this also lends to what we're looking to do, which is to highly and very quickly increase our engagement in low income countries and lower middle income countries. So we have a greater risk appetite um, so that we can invest with local companies, but really hit these these developmental challenges that maybe previously weren't very commercially viable but are something that the DFC is engaged in. And one way that we can be risky, and um, I think you know everyone loves more money, is that Congress doubled our budget by appropriating 30 billion more dollars so that we can take more risks, but also invest in more countries. Um, 
We also have new tools uh, in my presentation. I highlighted um, our key tools, but the, the core OPIC products are still there, which includes uh, debt financing and political risk insurance. But some of our new tools include um, equity investments that was launched in December of last year. And this allows us to invest in a company. We can have a board seat. Um, we can we can invest in startups. Um, of course, they still had to pass our due diligence and screening process. But again, it's a relatively new tool. We've already gotten a lot of um, applications across sectors, including healthcare, uh, renewable energy, um, some infrastructure projects, but also SME, um, really cool SMEs that are doing really just incredible, innovative things. So our equity tool is really to help push for innovation. Um, another thing that we're building on that came from our OPIC legacy is building on our partnerships and relationships, and that includes building on our, our nascent cooperation with Taiwan ICDF, but also working with other DFIs, development finance institutions, and with our partners uh, across the region. That includes, um, for me, for, for Asia, that includes Japan, Australia, Taiwan, and Singapore but also working with CABE and um, with DFIs that work in Latin America. So we're definitely looking to increase those partnerships and pool our resources because with COVID, but of course with any challenges, um, things are exponentially more difficult and we need as much investment as possible. Um, we're also, weren't necessarily regional focused, just really kind of primarily looking at commercial, commercially viable transactions, but I think one, um, key factor that is that is transitioning from OPEC to DFC is Latin America has always been one of our largest investment destinations, and that continues to be the case. Again, it's 30% of our portfolio, and we're looking to continue that, if not increase. Um, as Ambassador Spalding alluded to, um, climate is going to be a big focus of ours. Uh, we're looking to have our portfolio net zero, which means that we are phasing out fossil fuel investments and really looking at renewable energy technology, whether it's through um, solar and wind, um, but also innovative technology that can work to provide strong base load capacity for countries uh, for their energy needs, which are only increasing, of course, with um, connectivity and uh, development. Um, we're also looking to, in the next couple of years, allocate one third of our investments to climate related investments, and that includes the mitigation and adaptation strategies. And that could be um, something along the lines of improving infrastructure, whether it's um, building up seawalls or using low carbon emitting cement or improving trans, uh, transportation networks with uh, last mile electric vehicles or trying to produce more electric vehicles to reduce pollution and carbon footprint. Um, so that's the main differences, you know, at our core, we're still a development finance institution, but we're really looking to tackle uh, global development challenges. Um, I think many have been highlighted today for the Latin American region and to do it through private. The FC and uh, wonderful you got that new, the new finance. So I think all of our countries will look forward to, to, to using your contact information and your colleague at the Latin American and Car Caribbean desk. So thank you for your reply. I now like to pass a question on to Mr. Liu who we received this uh, through the chat box of YouTube. And the, the question is, uh, ICDF is an official development assistance organization. And in that role, how do you see organization, um, the vision, and in your own more than 20 years experience, Mr. Liu? Uh, okay, thanks for that uh, question. Uh, Taiwan ICDF, uh, Organization strategies has uh, embodied actually has embodied the principles of uh, good governance, environmental friendly, uh, inclusive growth, uh, as well as sustainable development. Uh, uh, it basically provides the guidance for all foreign aid work to comply, and and uh, this work is is corresponding to the uh, ESG criteria required in the sustainable finance. And based on the strategies, uh, we, we, we do have a key performance in, 
indicators so, uh, relevant, relevant to sustainable finance. And uh, these KPI are, uh, are traced and uh, reported to periodically to our board and the government for uh, further reviews uh, to ensure our mandate are uh, highly linked with the uh, international trend. Uh, in addition, our strategies are uh, required requires all projects uh, to fulfill the cross-cutting checkpoint in both gender uh, equities and environmental sustainability as well. Uh, this is to make sure uh, the financing and the investment uh, decisions are made, um, are made uh, consciously and uh, responsibly. Uh, that's for my answers. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Liu. Uh, of course, I think everything we do now, if we don't look at the sustainability of it, uh, of course, this is a key factor uh, looking towards the SDGs, as you mentioned. So thank you very much for it, your reply and, and for the work. I'd like to ask uh, Mario, if he can uh, briefly also give his vision on, on what are the major obstacles that you see in the small and medium enterprises in Paraguay uh, to obtain the sustainable financing in the post-COVID-19 uh, growth. Yes, thank you, Mr. Spalding. Uh, yes, uh, great question. I think the, the most important issue in sustainable finances is the lack of access to the formal credit. Due to the lack of formalization of Paraguayan SMEs, this became more visible with the current COVID-19 pandemic. Um, despite the, the action taken by the government, actual government, such as Fogapi, uh, the go, uh, that is the government uh, guarantee fund for SMEs. And by the other way, it's important to mention that the 70% of the SMEs in Paraguay operate informally. In other words, uh, of approximately 900,000 uh, SMEs, only uh, 270,000, uh, more or less, are formal. Just 30% uh, of all SMEs. The project that I present today operates on this 17% of SMEs, the informal sector. Finally, uh, I want to say that this kind of project try to uh, formalize the SMEs in Paraguay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mario. Formalization is, of course, key to have access also to the social network, the workers. So thank you for all the work you're doing in the Ministry of Industry and Trade of Paraguay. And I'd like the, to complete the first round, I'd like to ask Lisa, if, uh, if you could briefly mention the work that Guatemala is doing in the high-level political forum every year uh, in the presentation of the voluntary national reviews. And in this sense, uh, I think Guatemala is about or has presented this month uh, its third report um, of the VNR. Uh, and in that sense, are there any topics of relevance to sustainable financing in the report? And if so, are you able to briefly discuss uh, what you have found? Yes, of course. Yes, it's correct that we had our um, review this week, actually, um, for the S SDGs. And uh, on regards to sustainable financing, I would like to highlight a few programs that were implemented as a response to the COVID-19 crisis to help um, our financial sector. Uh, that, this was helped by the, the loan that we got that we received uh, from the World Bank. Um, first, I would like to highlight the program for support of the small and medium enterprises. In this uh, program, there was 400 million quetzales that were distributed amongst small and medium enterprises in order to help mitigate uh, the impact of the pandemic. These were not direct loans. However, it was worked as a two-layer system 
in which we use uh, uh, credit unions and NGOs and uh, other alliances in order to be able to give these credits to the small businesses. Additionally, there was a um, program that helped the popular commerce or what we know as informal economy, uh, where 100,000 people were benefited with 1,000 quetzales per person, especially in the very beginning of the pandemic when we had restrictions um, with the schedule and that they couldn't go out and um, continue with their uh, commerce mostly on streets and local markets. As well, I would like to highlight that there was uh, financial support directly to the families uh, or the population. We had what was called the family bonus or bono familia, in which over 2 million people were benefited with 2,250 quetzales to help them, especially with so much job loss that, were, that there was in the beginning of the pandemic um, to help mitigate uh, the strain of lose on income, um, as well as the fund for protection of employment, which uh, in some sectors, there were people who got their work contracts suspended. So the government would pay them 75 quetzales daily for every day that the company suspended while they could pick up operations. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Lisa, and to all the panelists for the presentations and the excellent answers uh, in, 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 of the questions. Unfortunately, as always happens in these events, uh, even if it's virtual or not, but uh, we've run out of uh, time. We want to respect the participants' time. We've overrun a, a few minutes. I think it was very important to, to cover all the topics and to also at least have one round of questions. And I've been informed by the organizers that if there are any further questions, please feel free to submit them via YouTube email. Uh, and, and the participants, the panelists have all uh, kindly accepted to, to respond uh, any questions you might have uh, through, through email. Once again, thank you to, to the panelists. Thank you to the organizers. For me, it uh, has been a pleasure to be the moderator of this event. And it is a privilege now to uh, introduce Ambassador James Lee, who is the De De uh, Director General of the Taiwan, uh, the Taipei Economic and Cultural Office in New York, and thank him for co-hosting this event with ICDF. Uh, and I think we, we, we all take a lot of information to continue working together uh, using the words of synergy uh, to, to make the planet a better place for future generations. So thank you again. Uh, Ambassador Lee, the floor is yours. Thank you, Ambassador Spaulding, uh, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good morning and good evening. Uh, as we conclude this webinar, I want to thank you all for your active participation in making this webinar a great success. I learned a lot from our speaker's excellent presentation and truly enjoyed the productive discussion. I'm sure that our audience did as well. Financing for sustainable development is the, great, uh, is the key issue in the implementation of the 2030 Agenda, and sustainable financing for developing countries will continue to take on great importance in the years ahead. As we manage to bring the pandemic under control and move towards the post-COVID-19 future, the idea presents in today's webinar could have not been uh, timely. Uh, having said that, uh, sustainable development is truly a collaborative effort, and the webinar told us that partnership played an important role in achieving the SDGs. Uh, through multiple partnerships among government, ODA agencies, and international financial institutes, um, we can apply new strategies and develop innovative instruments to drive um, sustainable financing in response to the need for a stronger recovery. On the note, 
Taiwan is a worth, uh, trustworthy and constructive partner in the implementation of the 2030 Agenda. Taiwan has been working with Paraguay, Guatemala, and many other Latin American countries since the 1970s. Over decades of cooperation, projects have changed from emphasizing technical support in agriculture uh, to providing si financial support uh, to small and medium-sized enterprise. It's evident that sustainable financing is the right tool to foster economic transformation and social development in this regard. Uh, meanwhile, we are glad to see that CABED, Central American Bank for Economic Integration, established its first office outside of Central America in Taiwan earlier this month. As Mr. Hernan Danary Alvarado stated, CABED has already uh, developed long-standing fruitful relationships with Taiwan's key institution. And these openings will help accelerate our coordination and facilitate transformation in ESG assistance. These examples highlight Taiwan's commitment to playing a proactive and constructive role in sustainable financing. Uh, while the discussion today was a great start there is still a lot of work ahead of us. I hope that policy makers and practitioners uh, around the world, uh, and in Latin America in particular, will find today's meeting helpful in their efforts in crafting strategies and approaches for a sustainable future. Again, thank you all for your active participation and contributions. I wish you continued success and good health. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador Lee, for your closing remarks, uh, which we value very much and uh, continue to collaborate with, with Taiwan, with different uh, branches that you have to work with our countries, and also uh, to thank all of the panelists, speakers for their presentations. Uh, and, and as I mentioned before, uh, and as you have said, Ambassador Lee, this is a great be beginning, but much has to be done. So we have to continue to work together uh, for, for future generations. So thank you again to, to everyone. With this, we conclude the webinar and we will continue uh, our conversation through email if there are any further questions. So thank you again to everyone.